A few years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go longboarding at night. As my friends and I were quite the night owl, we loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the road or the paths that we frequented. Even when using the main road, it would be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area. You could also hear them coming from very far away due to their headlights and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not even getting home till the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride for a few miles away from our usual back road to take one of our favorite hidden routes. It began with a narrow paved path that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under due to the rain, and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long, and was extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny moving ball of dim light. It moved very strangely and was extremely difficult to make out what it actually was. Rather than shine our flashlight down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to one another about what we thought it could possibly be. All at once, that small light turned into multiple blinding lights and extremely loud revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the darkened silence. Acting purely upon fear, we turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off the path into a very dark, very overgrown hole in the side of a hill, overlooking where we had just come from. We immediately decided to hide in that natural dugout, hoping the plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers and two on full-size motorcycles. They were yelling at one another about something, but we couldn't quite make out what they were saying due to the distance that we'd covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculated on who these people could be. Our first original thought was maybe they were park rangers of some kind. Although we'd never seen one here in many times that we'd been through. And honestly, we doubted that this country had the budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely appropriate for paved bike trails. And they were all very angry about something. They called out to us for quite a while yelling things like, We know you're out there. And we can see you. Come on out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one of the men yell, Find them now! And then smash a bottle. That had erased any hope we had that these were just park rangers. We watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path that we'd come from. It took us a while and what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout, watching those lights from the vehicles traveling through the woods and pass, one of them already coming full circle and passing the point he'd started from. I thought about calling out for help, but I was too afraid to open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach their further distance from us, we summoned up the nerve and tried to run somewhere far enough to get away to safely make a phone call. We ran hard and fast through those woods. Since their headlights gave away their location on these paths, we would hide again whenever we felt they were getting too close. Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense. And the fear I felt, waiting for one of them to drive past again, basically only being covered in leaves and plants, is still unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of the two main roads, far from where we'd started. We ducked down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened up my phone, I noticed that I had recent missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who was supposed to meet up with us after our longboard excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. And luck was with us again. He hadn't given up our plans despite us ignoring him. He was only a few miles away, heading in our direction. 
I gave him the names of the two streets that we were near and explained that we needed picked up right away. He agreed and sped over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did and we bolted into the back seats of his car, yelling for him to get the hell out of there and he took off. Relief doesn't even begin to describe what I felt driving safely home after everything we just experienced. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured that they would be gone by the time any officer had made it out there and that we'd be only putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law by taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or even who those people were. I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family. Some think that we walked right up into a huge drug deal. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started, we couldn't see. Our minds both went straight to some kind of chainsaw-wielding horror movie serial killer. So I suppose it couldn't have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought that we saw made them want to catch us so badly we never actually saw. So I guess we'll never really know, I suppose. There's an abandoned house between my town and the next town on one of the country roads that connect us. I've been to it before, and even went inside twice with my sister and one of my best friends. It's an old house that dates back centuries, according to the bank records I was able to find. And you can just tell by the design itself. The house is two stories with a basement. It has a lot of furniture and objects strewn about inside, but it's far from empty. You can tell that it hasn't been lived in for decades, and whoever had it previously almost seemed like they just disappeared one day, leaving everything behind. The way I was able to get in before was through the cellar door in the basement, which is broken open and propped open with some big sticks. My first visit was around two years ago, and I hadn't gone back in all the time. Another friend expressed interest in seeing the house when I told him about my experience, and so, last summer, I told him that I'd take him with me. I never thought it was a dangerous trip, and just told him that it was an interesting place to explore. We parked across the street from the house, in the parking lot of one of the industrial buildings. The road was a rural one, but it was far from unused, and we didn't want to be questioned by anyone. My friend, being braver than me despite previous visits, led the way across the street into the front of the house. He asked me a couple of questions about it, about the stuff I found in there. I told him that the kitchen still had expired food in it. The upstairs had a board game set that I ended up bringing home with me. As we walked from the front of the house to the side, leading to the back with the cellar, I made a note. There was a lot more brush than when we'd been last time. I had gone in the spring when I'd gone with my sister and best friend, and I never experienced the thick brush that I was now. I made a comment to my friend about it, and we both tried to figure out a path to the cellar. Eventually, we pushed through some branches and found the cellar, broken and propped open, just as I'd last seen it. We talked for a minute, being nervous, and I really took in the view of the cellar that led to the dark, abandoned house. I remember being really intimidated while looking at the opening, and I also made a mental note that some of the sticks propping open the cellar didn't look familiar to me. I didn't state it out loud, just figured it was my anxiety. My friend and I discussed who should go first, and he said, since I'm the expert, I should head in first. I was hesitant. But eventually, after a good five minutes of breathing and calming myself down, I started down the few steps of the cellar. It was an awkward entrance, as half the cellar was collapsed and left little room for maneuvering. You had to duck under a part of the cellar door that was still put together, then inch your feet down the steps, then finally turn your body sideways to fit through the small gap into the basement itself. It took a long time after ducking under the door. Since my nerves came back for a second, I made it in just fine. My friend followed quickly behind, which I appreciated. We both just stood in the corner of the basement now, taking it all in. I turned my phone's flashlight on and he did as well. There was a spider web in the path to the stairs up to the first floor. I looked around and found some sort of tool to knock the spider web down. So I took the tool, swiped it through, and then after that, I tossed the tool onto the concrete floor. My friend and I talked quietly. I don't remember exactly about what, but afterwards, we fell silent for a second, above us, 
I clearly heard a footstep on the boards above our heads. It almost seemed like they were heading towards the stairs that led down to the basement. I remember this part the best. As I looked at my friend, he didn't seem to react to the footsteps that I was hearing. I looked at him, suddenly very worried, and before I could even say anything, he said, We need to go. He turned around and practically jumped up the stairs. And I remember thinking he got out insanely fast. I could see him turn and reach his hands to help me back up. I was a bit slower, but I also quickly stepped up the stairs as he pulled me through the opening. I landed on my hands and knees after I escaped the cellar, and I immediately stood up, facing the weeds. I turned around to my friend who was crouched, staring down the cellar still. I said to him that we should get out of here, and he turned away quickly and told me to go first through the weeds. I pretty much just sprinted through the brush, definitely getting cut up by something, but we made it through them and back in front of the house very quickly. My friend kept urging me to go in front of him, and he watched behind us before switching to flashing his light in the windows on the first floor of the house. I asked him what he was doing and if he was okay. He didn't really answer me at first, so I asked if he heard those footsteps before we'd bolted out of the basement. He told me that he'd heard them, and that's why he was watching the cellar to see if anyone was going to follow us out. He continued, saying that after he pulled me up, he turned to guide me away before he let go of my hand. And when he turned back, he saw the bare feet of someone standing at the bottom of that cellar. Because of the cellar's dilapidated structure, he could only see their feet and a part of their legs. At that point, that's when he told me to go through the weeds first. He never saw them come up the stairs or move away before he followed quickly behind me. At first, I didn't believe him. I thought he was just trying to scare me, but I could tell by the serious tone of his voice and the silent look he gave me after telling me about it that he wasn't trying to make me laugh or lighten the mood. I still asked if he was lying, and he aggressively said that he wasn't. He told me that I heard the footsteps already, so I knew something had to be in that house. We stood for a second, not really saying anything, before we both agreed to go back across the street toward our cars. We stood by our cars for a while, watching the house to see if anything or anyone would come out. Nothing ever appeared. After him reassuring me that he was telling me the truth, it started to rain and we called it a night. I fully believe him, and he's always stood by what he saw. We still haven't gone back to that house since. I like to tell myself that whoever was in there was just a homeless person finding shelter. But I still get shivers to this day, thinking about how close that person was to me as I scrambled up those cellar stairs. This happened around a year ago. There were so many terrible factors working against me that night that I'm astounded that I got away unscathed, at least physically. It all began when I was at my friend's apartment, who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of God knows what. I know, I know. Safe to say, after a solid night of partying, around 4am I was not in the right state of mind. My drug addled brain decides that instead of staying the night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to Uber back to my own apartment. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances and exits to the building. One in the back and an unlit parking lot of the building and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door, and I only had the keys to the one in the back of the apartment. Since my Uber would obviously arrive at the street, the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you. I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. Looking back, standing outside that apartment, I realized I looked like the easiest target on the planet. I'm a small, petite female in my early 20s, and I can hardly stand upright. I'm using a street lamp to prop myself up and not doing a great job at it either. The light was basically a beacon for any nearby predator saying, Come get me. I'm not paying attention to my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door I just came out of. Not good. I remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulled up to the curb and started rolling down the window, so I stepped forward. Before this man even spoke, I could feel something was wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes. After seeing that look, it gave me new meaning to the word predator. 
to describe a criminal. Because then, I knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically just barked at me. I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way to my brain. Normally, Uber drivers just roll down the window and say, Fossil Fuel 12 or any version of that, but always including your name. I think I just stared at him for a second. My brain slowly putting together the pieces of the situation I was potentially in. So I ask him, what's my name? He immediately is enraged, starts screaming about how he doesn't have fucking time for this. Just get in the fucking car. I don't think I've ever sobered up so fast in my life. I'm completely panicking now. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. Quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see it's not a match. Meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me the whole time and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me or maybe he has a weapon. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl off the street, he has to have some kind of weapon. I couldn't run back into the apartment door behind me since it locked behind you and I don't have the keys nor the time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well as he's idling right by the mouth of the driveway towards the back of the parking lot. And again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys just to get inside. If I screamed, I'm not exactly in the type of neighborhood where someone would try to be a vigilante. And I can still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment. I knew they wouldn't hear me. It's 4 a.m. and there's absolutely no one else around. People talk a lot on this sub, how they either sprint into action or just freeze. But I felt incapable of doing neither. It was the absolute worst feeling I've ever felt in my entire life. Everything inside of me wanted to just run, but I felt like if I did, that truly would be the end of me. But if I just keep standing there, staring in shock at the screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me to this point, I'm guessing 20 seconds has passed. Just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulled up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I can, I realize that it's my actual Uber and make a full-on sprint to the car and throw myself inside, screaming at the real Uber driver, What's my name? That poor man looked terrified but responded quickly with my name, to which I reply, Get me the fuck out of here. That man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would be too shocked to react as quickly as he did. But my dude flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined and now regret, and then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring that I got inside safely. Truly an incredible human being. You can rest easy knowing that he got the fattest tip of my college student bank account would allow for, although he deserved much, much more. So to the man who ruined my sense of security and caused countless anxiety attacks when out in public for months, it's never meet again. My story takes place in a very small town in the northeast region of the United States in the summer before I went to college in 2015. After I graduated high school, my parents decided to move to a smaller, more affordable house about 45 minutes north into the mountains. We stayed in my childhood home because the public schools in my area were the best in the state and my parents really valued my education. I ended up going off to an amazing university. Now I have an incredible career because of that excellent education. As most people in the US know, amazing public education usually means higher property taxes. My parents got to the point where they could not afford the taxes on their 4,000 square foot home anymore and decided to sell it just after I graduated high school. Their home is humble and it sits on a beautiful piece of land on the side of a beautiful mountain. The trees are always so green and there's a lot of wildlife around. They don't have many neighbors either as their driveway is about a mile and a half long but this is what they chose to live on after I went to college. In August of 2015, we moved into this new house. I wasn't planning on staying long as I was getting ready to head off to college as a freshman for the first time. We decided to have a little housewarming party with a bunch of family friends and my best friend at the time as well. My dad was manning the barbecue and my mom was making drinks while we were playing with our dogs. It was a grand time and everyone had so much fun. My dad had built a brick fire pit in our backyard. Just to set the scene for you here, 
The fire pit was about 30 feet from our back patio door. And we had a picnic table and other seats all around. Behind the seating was a tree line. It was so dark sometimes at night that you needed a flashlight to see 10 feet in front of you. With the fire pit lit, you couldn't see someone unless they were either sitting next to you or across from you next to that fire pit. My best friend decided to stay the night, and we asked my dad if we could make some s'mores, as it was getting a little chilly, as it does in the late summer in the northeast at night. My parents left us outside with my dog, Nino. Nino was a huge 100-pound black lab pit bull mix. He was such a loyal and incredible dog that my dad truly loved and trained as his right hand. He was our protector, as he could run extremely fast and was very strong, and alerted us when something went bump into the night. Side note. He passed away a week before I got married in 2022. He was 17 years old and lived an adventurous life with my parents, hunting squirrels, laying out in the sun, and running amok. Nino lay in between us, facing that tree line. My best friend was to my right. Our backs were to the dark, dense tree line. Our first mistake. We were laughing and joking and eating the s'mores together, planning our future, and generally excited about going off to college together. She decided to play some music, and we just sat back and relaxed, feeling content and at ease. It was the perfect summer night, and Nino started growling. I saw his ears perk up, his head cocked at the side. He sat up and continued to growl. My best friend and I looked at one another, thinking Nino just saw like a stray animal or something non-threatening. This area was known for lots of deer and rarely a coyote or wolf. As I mentioned before, he was trained to help my dad hunt, so we assumed it was some kind of buck or fawn in the distance. We didn't think much of it, and just went back to singing along to the music and talking about our fall class schedule. Again, Nino started growling. We did not call out for my dad, which was our second mistake. We didn't even think there was a problem until Nino started barking repeatedly, growing louder and more vicious. He then stood up started barking as if to alert us that there was activity beyond that tree line that we could not see. So we stood up as well, the fire obscuring our view. My best friend took out her phone, paused the music, and turned on her flashlight. She began to walk towards the edge of the tree line with Nino just by her side, still growling and barking. We stood still, in silence, just listening. I was too afraid to even breathe at this point. She started walking a little bit deeper into the woods when she signed her flashlight and saw a figure, someone peering at us from within those woods behind a tree. A man with a green shirt and green pants on. We screamed and ran as fast as we could inside, leaving the fire unattended and that creepy man behind the tree. We did not know at the time where this man had come from. We crashed through our front door, breathless with Nino tailing behind us and startled my mother who was washing dishes and cleaning up after the party. She was talking to my dad about something, and they cut them off mid-sentence to explain that there was a man dressed in all green lurking behind a tree in our woods. We didn't know how long he'd been there or if he was still there. We were both hysterical and crying. I remember feeling extremely sick like I was going to throw up. My dad jumped up, grabbed a shotgun and a headlamp, and ran outside with Nino. My mom quickly gathered us into the living room, shut off all the lights in the house, and locked the doors. She told us to be quiet she was going to call 911. As she did that, my best friend and I just shook with fear. We anticipated hearing gunshots and screaming. Never heard any. My mom was now on the phone with a 911 dispatch, describing what we saw to the operator. And I heard my mom say, oh, in an alarming way. At this point, my dad came back inside and my mom let him know that the police were on their way to us. Being in a small town on the mountain with less than 10,000 people means... We don't get our own police force. We get the state police every time there's a call. My dad put his gun away and waited outside for the police to show up. To our bewilderment, they didn't send just one police officer, but ten, and an entire SWAT team and helicopter to circle the area. We were rightfully terrified, and I was practically having a panic attack at this point. The police officers came inside of our home and asked myself and my best friend what the man was wearing and what he looked like asking us if we were able to discern any scars or tattoos. We told them the weird matching green outfit and about him wearing glasses. The officer excused himself and alerted the police and SWAT members outside of our description. 
not long after, started to search the woods behind our home with their guns drawn, flashlights out, with the helicopter circling from above. They advised us to stay inside, and they would let us know if and when they found something. After about 25 minutes, we got a knock on our door. It was not one, but two officers. My dad let them in and they began to explain the situation at hand. One of the officers explained that we had to have seen on the news that a convicted felon from the prison about 20 miles away had escaped into the mountains. The police had set up a perimeter about 10 miles around the prison, but the convict had escaped them yet again. The outfit the man was wearing, as well as our description, signaled to them that the escaped convict was 100% lurking around in our remote, densely wooded backyard that night. The all-green outfit was a standard issue for prisoners in my state. They did not, however, find the man near us after 25 minutes of searching, so we had to be still out there. The officers then let us know that they were going to have a squad car stay and watch our house for a few days, as they were unable to locate the fugitive and believe he's still an active threat to our safety. So for that night, and for three nights after that, we all slept in the living room together. My dad's shotgun was within arm's reach at all times. Later that week, we got another knock at our door from the officer stationed outside of our house. They let us know that the man was back in police custody, and that we were safe. They also recommended and advised us to get some security cameras, and apologized that all this happened to us. My parents spent a lot of money on some security cameras, and fenced in our backyard. We now have four cameras to watch the tree line at all times. I guess you never know what will happen, or what goes bump in the night. I was a home health nurse for many years, and this time I had to go see a new patient. When we had to go see a new patient, we had a ridiculous amount of information to get. Thankfully, the company gave us new laptops, so it wasn't so bad. This particular patient needed wounded care on his foot and IV therapy. When I finally found his house, I pulled into his driveway and sat there for a few minutes. I immediately had that feeling like someone was watching me, so I sat there for a couple of minutes thinking, don't really want to go into this house. I gathered my stuff and walked up to the door. My patient answered and let me inside. It was a ranch style home with an open concept kitchen, living room and dining room. My patient was barefoot, except for the wound dressing. He went into the kitchen to wash his hands as I set up my computer and a few other things at the dining table. I sat with my back to the living room. As I was starting up my laptop, I heard someone in heavy shoes walk down the hallway from one of the bedrooms and then stop behind me. A feeling overwhelmed me, like that whatever that was was still standing behind me. I turned around to introduce myself, but no one was there. I turned around the other way, and still I saw no one. I looked around to see if there was a doorway that maybe I hadn't seen. I started to feel like, what the f is this? I know someone was there. I could feel it. My patient was watching me and chuckling to himself. He then said, What's the matter? I said, Oh, nothing. I thought I heard someone walk up behind me. He still had a grin on his face and asked me, Are you, uh, sensitive? I said, Well, kind of. Why? He said, Do ghosts bother you? If they do, you don't have to do this. I politely said, No, I'm okay. Why? All the while, my patient is still grinning and told me, we have a ghost, but you don't have to be scared. He's friendly, but he does like to screw with people. He also was into computers, so he might be wanting to see what you're doing. He's kind of protective, but I think he'll be okay with you. He's a friend of mine. I rented this place off of him and his wife, and he was very into construction, and he was always over here helping me fix things. We had a problem with the roof, and he was up there two years ago fixing it. He had been up and down ladders all of his life. We don't know what happened, but he lost his balance getting off the roof onto the ladder and fell headfirst onto the driveway. We called 911 and did what we could. They life flighted him. They said he was gone by the time they landed. They kept him on life support till the family came into town. I don't think he knows he's dead because he never left. He's still here. We hear him walking around on the roof, in the basement, and around the house. Things move. Tools go missing. He always had his heavy work boots on. And you can hear him walking real easy. 
He always said that he wanted to die in these boots. And he did. While he was talking, I had the strongest feeling of someone just right in my face, looking over my shoulder at my computer. I told him this, and he said that it was probably just him wanting to check out the laptop, see what I was doing. I just shrugged my shoulders and said, Okay, well, let's do this. I was kind of intrigued, so I figured that I would probably just treat him like any other family member. I could feel him next to me, so strongly. I turned to where I could feel him, introduced myself, explained my laptop, and what I was going to do. As soon as I turned my attention to my patient, it felt like someone kicked my chair on the leg so hard it shifted me a few inches. My patient just laughed and said, <laughs> Told you he screws with people. This continued throughout the whole visit. I never really felt threatened, but it's not something I want to do again. And it goes without saying that this was the last time that I saw that patient. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All of these links are below. What's up everybody? How are you doing? Hope you're having a great day. Um, it's fucking... It's like 62 degrees out here. Uh, right now it's nice and shun shunny <laughs> it's nice and sunny um i'm really really stoked for spring and summer like i feel like we haven't had at least here we haven't had a super bad winter but it's just been long and constantly teasing me with one day where it'll be like 55 and then go back to being 30 and then we'll snow a little bit here and we'll have some freezing rain and uh, oh, 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 oh 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 you think it's you think it's spring nah bro i'm just fucking with you it's still winter like, Mother Nature just constantly messing with me, and it's getting old. Like, let's just... Let's can we get warm and stay warm, please? Thank you. Please, 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 thank you. Yeah, I'm sure you don't really give a shit about talking about the weather, but it was the first thing in my mind. Um, also, I have done this formula in the past, and I kind of fell out of it, but I'm getting back into it because I want to. So, moving forward, as of right now... When it comes to my episodes, the themed episode during the week is going to have visuals. It's going to have visuals to accompany the story. There's more than likely not going to be any rain for those ones. And they're going to have sound effects. Doors closing, doors knocking, people screaming like Mr. Nightmare, that type of style. Um, I've seen a lot of channels blow up because they do that style so and I really like those the shorter ones where they're like maybe 10 to 15 minutes long and they have visuals to accompany with them it's a lot more work it's a hell of a lot more work but um, I think it's an experiment I want to try and see if it might garner any more attention to get my channel to lift off a little bit more so again um, themed episodes during the week will have visuals they're going to be shorter probably 10 20 minutes max and then true scary stories will occasionally feature other narrators, but they're always going to have rain. They're always going to be longer and I'm going to make them kind of do being scared style where um, I put a little bit extra rain on the end of it. So those are going to be once a week. So you'll still get those once a week. So I'm going to be kind of like killing two birds with one stone. Um, there's some of you that really enjoy the, the rain and the true scary stories like that. And it's got like an ASMR, fall asleep, whatever. So you're going to get the fix with that. And then throughout the week, when you get the shorter episodes, those are ones that are just bite sized, smaller content, easier to, and yeah, they'll be over quicker, obviously, because they'll be shorter, but you'll have visuals. It'll keep you super entertained and like be scary and keep you like, cause that's how I feel about Mr. Nightmare. And all these other stories or channels that do that style where they can, um, yeah, they, they're, they're scary. The stories are scary. And when I originally launched this channel, I did not really 
because I don't know how to feel about putting people to sleep. That's not why I launched this channel. It's not why I'm doing this. Like, it's cool that this has become like an ASMR type of thing for people where they can fall asleep to it. And I'm happy and excited that I can do it. But at the same time, it's like a backhanded compliment. Like, I, I want to do this to scare people or unsettle you. You know, uh, where, damn, that was a good story. That was, that was crazy. I can't believe, blah, blah, you know, that type of thing. Don't really, I'm glad it, it can hit, uh, you know, people with the whole ASMR drift off to sleep, hear some rain. That's cool. And I enjoy it. And I'm glad that there's something, you know, garnering people and people getting some kind of enjoyment out of it. So I'm, again, I'm just going to do both. Going to still do what I originally planned when I launched this channel, as well as do the True scary stories with rain. So you get best of both worlds. Hopefully um, that's cool with you, but that's my plan moving forward. I originally did it before and then I kind of stopped and was only doing the theme sh the three themed themed episodes with rain, just like the true scary stories. But as of right now, I think that's really what I want to do because I want to see what happens. And I enjoy doing them uh, a lot more just because of how much more work goes into it. And you get more scared when you have the sound effects and stuff like that. So if you're listening to this and you want to fall asleep, those themed episodes aren't going to be the one. And I think moving forward as well, I'd, I've never really had a, um, a, a schedule or a set schedule. So moving forward, yeah, you can hear my cat. Um, all right, Moe's, be quiet. Come on, bro. Gosh. All right, you get to listen to that too. Um... Uh, themed episodes Tuesday, True Scary Stories on Thursday. Okay, so that is my plan moving forward. That is what the scheduling is going to be. I'm pretty sure from here on out. Um, sometimes that might change or vary, so just uh, be on the lookout for that. Drop some theme stuff you want to hear before. Let me know what you think about this episode and more. Um, I love you all. I appreciate every single one of you. All the support, all the likes, all the comments, all that stuff. Yeah, um, I think that's it. All right, so I will talk to you Tuesday, next themed episode. Don't know what I'm doing yet, but we'll find out. All right. All right, I love y'all. We'll see you then. Cheers.